Greetings, I am Joffrey, and welcome to my second video on Elder Kings 2. Today we focus on culture, as the dev team has put a great deal of effort into making each race of Elder Kings 2 unique in both appearance and playstyle. Now let's get this out of the way before anything else. No, you cannot breed men or mer with beast races. The coast for goblins as well. The creations of minotaurs are a very specific lore exception to that rule. The devs tried letting all races intermarry once or twice. It has never gone even remotely well. I have seen things most horrific in my search through the Discord for information. All my information has been discovered by myself through scouring the mod's Discord server and reading dev diary. Therefore, note that my information is very likely to be outdated in many places due to development being ongoing and the information I present here coming from across the last couple of years. I am also certain that even more of this information will be outdated or at least lacking by release, and it is also likely that I will miss various pieces of relevant information as it can be difficult to manage so many small snippets of information. Therefore, I plan to make amendments videos, this one, and any other deep dive mod videos I make, as I learn of things that I've missed, and when new updates are released. Or at the very least, I'll make a pinned comment, or add it to the description. Therefore, I welcome any viewers who notice my missing or poorly explaining facts to inform me in the comments section or in my discord server. Let me know which mod I should dive into next. Elder Kings 2 aims to treat culture much as with religions, by increasing the granularity amongst various culture groups of Tamriel, where High Rock in Elder Kings 1 is almost entirely the basic Breton culture. In Elder Kings 2, High Rock's Breton culture will be split into several new, smaller ones to better represent the fragmented, petty kingdom nature of the region and its people. In fact, there will also be a single county of the old horseman culture of Yokuda tucked away in the mountains of the far north. While this new diversity is excellent for flavor, on its own it would quickly be stamped out by any force that unites a province. This has led to the development of the ingenious new Nativity Region system. This system assigns every county to one such region, and each region has a list of cultures that are native to said region. What this does, beyond adding flavor in the cultural innovations, is speeding up the spread of a culture that is native to a county, while all other cultures will take far longer to convert, several decades in most cases. This may sound infuriating to many, however, there is another way to convert local cultures. Though the final implementation is uncertain for now, the steward will have an ability to bring in people of your culture group from various regions. This will enable a Breton, in the former orc-controlled Rothgarian Mountains, to spread the Northman culture, native to Northern High Rock and the Western Reach, as well as a Breton in North Hammerfell to spread the Iliac culture, this enables a conqueror to tighten their hold on a region, while maintaining some of the diversity of the varied regions of Tamriel. Inviting people from your culture group may not be as good as your direct culture, however, lessens the penalties. Not to mention, if the culture you choose is native to the region, in question, it speeds up conversion vastly. This only goes so far, however as we can hardly expect to find any Nords hanging about who are familiar with the climate of Yokuda or the Somerset Isles. This leads an aspiring conqueror with one more option, nomadic cultures. Nomadic cultures do not have a nativity region, rather they wander from place to place across Tamriel and beyond. Most orcs are examples of nomads. The inevitable destruction of each and every iteration of Orsinium has left them scattered and without a region to call their own. Pariah folk can be found across Tamriel, and due to their nomadic lifestyle, can settle down in any region they can hold on to, albeit slightly slower than the locals. This is a trade-off, however, 
as nomads may easily be removed from a region if they lose control, swiftly replaced by the natives. Therefore, an Orzimer conqueror has the capability to convert vast swaths of land they get their hands on to be majority orc. However, they can be quickly turned into history once new management takes control. Where will your Arsinium be built, I wonder? Mine will either be in Valenwood or Black Marsh. As with everything, there are exceptions to every rule. And the rule of nativity regions is no... exception? What did I even just say? The point is, there will be a rare chances to both expand nativity regions, and even more rarely, revive dead cultures. Tamriel's history is vast, and its peoples diverse in body and soul. Across the ancient past, many of the once dominant cultures of Nern have been reduced to forgotten corners. With once continent spanning traditions erased, the Aelids and their Nedic slaves are both examples of once vast cultures that now barely cling to life. The Aelids having been driven into other elven lands and assimilated, while the needs of Cyrodiil changed over time through cultural advancements and the mingling of bloodlines. For now, there are few confirmed dead cultures that can be brought back with this new system to revive dead cultures. The Aelids, for example, while being a non-factor in Elder Kings 2's start date, are stated in one dev diary to be a dead culture that may be revived, yet in another are stated to have remnants that can be found in, quote, the most remote corners of Tamriel. I can only take this to mean that there will both be tucked away remnants of alien culture that players can take command of, as well as the ability to revive it as another elf character under the right circumstances. Previously, Nidic peoples were spread across the continent of Tamriel, everywhere from High Rock to Black Mark, their once needs. However, only three of the Nidic cultures have survived in any notable sense. The Kep two of Hammerfell's Alakir Desert, warrior smiths who adorn themselves in tattoos to signify their station. They have a spicy map color as well, I must say. The Kothringi of Black Marsh have silver reflective skin, akin to a living coat of mercury when in the light. These two Nidic cultures are barely clinging to life, though. By the time of the Interregnum, it would take a determined and steady hand for either of them to rise from their obscurity. Unless you choose to play the Keptu ruler, who immediately rushes to gain control of the Amethyst Mine of Vilati. Anyone who's played the Molly in Vanilla know why that is. And finally, the Reachmen. Yes. Uh, compared to their long-distance kin, the Reachmen have a portion of Tamriel to call their own. the very Reach they take their name from. The Reachmen live a tribal existence, dominating a stretch of land large enough to make any orc see, making the Reachmen the most capable of the Nidic descendants to recover their lost legacy, stating that this will be a grueling challenge. Be an underestimation, however. The requirements for doing so are staggering, in addition to the task of conquering land from the advanced and established realms Tamriel has seen in its long history. However, with Cyrodiil being torn to pieces and two high kings in Skyrim, perhaps now is the time for the needs to be born anew. As stated, the requirements are ludicrous and very specific to reach. Completely controlling the nativity region of the dead culture, converting a county to one of your culture group, which could take several decades at least. The scholar trait and being exalted among men are all rather difficult things to accomplish with the same character, and yet they would all need to be possessed to revive a dead culture. I am sure the Murr races will have a significantly less difficult time reaching these goals, however, due to their enhanced lifespans, if not for the monumentality of reviving a dead culture. I would have declared this in need of simplifying. As the devs will say, however, it is a work in progress. 
I will be most curious to see how they decide to go about restoring dead cultures by release. Naturally, innovations will not go untouched by EK2 in the lead-up to its first release. The timeline will be renamed to First Era, Early Interregnum, Time of Pretenders, and lastly, the Unification Wars. While the base game's mainline text will go nearly unchanged, new custom innovations will be added to help provide more flavor to each race and to Tamriel in general. Here I will present what has been shown off so far, and I am excited to see more in the future. The High Elves' Moonstone techniques are available to the Alenori and most likely any direct offshoots of their culture, such as the Balfieri Elves of the Iliac Bay. Providing stronger light foot, have, as well as plus one prowess and a 10% buff to monthly prestige gain. The refined moonstone plate innovation is also available to provide the unique Somerset Justiciers. It would not surprise me, however, if this innovation was unavailable to the elves outside of the Somerset. There will be a universal magic technology in each era that represents the advancement of magical study across time. At its base level, providing a free student of magicka trade for children taking the education focus in learning. In addition to a spell sword soldier type. The Reachmen, while I am sure they have access to this technology, as it was described as universal, will have access to their own unique brand of mage soldiers, the terrifyingly named Witch Knights, mounted warlocks and witches who use their old magic at high speeds in combat. Any ambitious Reachmen will want to make good use of these specialized forces. The Saesi have rather conflicting descriptions in various places that they are noted in lore. There seems to be no consensus as to their nature. Whether that be beast men with the lower half of a snake and scaly skin, snakes who can shapeshift by consuming beings, or that they are actually the human inhabitants of the native Akavir to the Far East. The Mon team has decided to mold their own version of the Saesi. The Saesi of AK2 will be depicted as the human inhabitants of Akavir and look no different from what you might expect a person from East Asia to look like. However, they possess a frightening ability. The team has not explained much as of yet. It has been stated, the more a Saesi consumes, the longer they live and the more snake-like they become. All we can do is speculate as to how this may function. However, I already know that the Saesi are at the top of my to play list. They even have their culture in a few places along the Nibine and South elsewhere in Black Marsh. Perhaps there are even a few enclaves of Saesi culture hidden in locations. Perhaps there are even enclaves of Saesi in hidden locations not so readily visible. So we will have lots of potential snacks to play with. The fact that the name of the Saesi culture we see in Cyrodiil and the South has changed names at some point in development further emphasizes to me that there will be a variety of Saesi to play. For example, back in Elder Kings 1, the Saesi had a unique matriarchal government type. This will carry over with adjustments to EK2, according to the team. Whenever Akavir is added, the Saesi and Akavir will be matriarchal, while those in Tamriel will be more male-oriented, providing what I see as an important piece of diversification for inheritance laws. Seeing as almost every race in the Elder Scrolls is very close to, if not in fact, equal succession in lore outside the orcs, I am happy to see things will be spiced up for gameplay. While the specifics of the history of Saesi matriarchy is currently unknown to me, I am aware that they consider their ruler to be a reincarnation of a Saesi woman. One who became either their first ruler, or supposedly ascended to godhood, perhaps both. As for why the Saesi of Tamriel are considered equal-ish, 
those who arrived in Tamriel did so as a large military force in search of a dragonborn to serve under. And since Sayesi society uses only men in its armies, the power structure and faith became less focused on their far-off matriarch, whom they no longer even serve, but one focused on the worship of the various cardinal directions, plus Tamriel itself. I failed to cover this in my faiths video. However, the Sayasi of Tamriel who worship Dawn's beauty of the four cardinal directions, as well as Tamriel itself, in their pantheon. As well as being an outlier as a male-dominated equal faith on a continent where laws relating to someone's sex are rarely found outside of cults and orcish strongholds. It is uncertain whether the dev team will choose to go with Dawn's beauty being an equal faith or male-oriented. Personally, I hope it will be male-oriented as a neat counterbalance to the female-oriented faith of their homeland, as well as being an opportunity to spice up the gameplay for a setting which sorely lacks in succession laws variety. There will be some custom names and coat of arms for titles across Tamriel. Currently, we know of the Cyrodiilic Empire and the High Kingdom of Skyrim's variation. In Skyrim, the High Kingdom will change its flag from the Jagged Crown to whichever hold the ruler has their capital in, assuming it is in Skyrim. While Cyrodiil has a few different versions of how the flag will look and its name, depending on which race controls the Empire. The name of the Empire, as well as many other titles across Cyrodiil, will change if the Aelids were to resurface and restore the Heartlands to their ancient control. With how fractured the time of the Interregnum is for the whole of Tamriel, it is hard to tell who will control each province by the time the dust settles. With this in mind, we can expect to find many renamed titles depending on which race controls a region. Even the orcs are going to have some new renames, if I remember correctly. Though, in all honesty, it's rather unlikely that we will see more than one orcish kingdom, if ever. And that's going to be called Orsinium, so it's unlikely that we will see much of that in practice. Dremora will not typically be available for play, as there are hardly many examples of Dremora realms popping up in Tamriel and sticking around longer than just to smash some stuff and leave. However, the devs have stated that there will be a Dremora pirate on an island that can be played. Supposedly, some players will even recognize them as well. Dremora will both have unique designs for their models, as well as having unique air generation mechanics. After all, Dremora don't exactly breed, therefore they will have some sort of summoning mechanic where Dremora characters create their family trees through calling more Daedra out of oblivion. The Lil Moffat, or Foxfolk, are a particularly obscure race in the Elder Scrolls that will be in the Elder Kings 2 on launch. They are known for only a handful of things. One, they traverse the swamps of Black Marsh on giant centipede-like creatures. Two, for being named after the only known settlement they've ever possessed. And three, all dying out by the time the modern Elder Scrolls games take place, along with every other non-Argonian race in Black Marsh. And the con... In... In... The con... The con the Kenhatten, the Kenhatten flu, theoretically caused by the histories wanting more security or something along those lines. When a map of the Somerset Isles was shown off in the Discord, the question of what happens to goblins after they're culturally converted came up. After all, they are likely nomadic cultures, which would make them rather easy to convert by the local race. And seeing as goblins don't have any realms that could act as bastions of their cultures, they would most likely all die out. In short order. The devs responded that they are considering making goblins capable of reinfesting a region after it's been removed. 
how such a system would function, and if it would apply to any other races in similar situations, such as the Minotaurs, is unknown, however. Yes, I love Minotaurs and incredibly hyped for them to have their own 3D models eventually. The struggle mechanic is planned to be implemented into the mod for Hammerfell, centering on the ancient conflict between the crowns and forebears, as well as likely the Alakir and Keptu peoples of the desert. After all, while most outsiders rarely think of Hammerfell as a threat, they are a proud warrior culture, and any time an outside influence seeks to control the region, other than the Empire of Cyrodiil and its relaxed style of leadership. They will work together to beat the third party senseless until they leave the Red Guards alone, only for the Red Guards to immediately go at each other's throats again. To paint a more clear image as to why the struggle mechanics work so well for the Red Guard is that there aren't many people left in Hammerfell other than the Red Guard cultures of Crown forebears, and Alakir, just outside of the Keptu of the deep inner desert. The reason for this is that when the Regada first arrived in Hammerfell from their sinking homeland of Yakuda, there were many people, but uh, the Red Guards following their god, whose name I hear literally translates into Make Way, decided this is their home now, and if anyone does not leave, they will be brutally murdered until their fellows decide to leave. Therefore, it is hardly a surprise that the only non-Redguard people still remaining in Hammerfell are kept to the deep interiors of the harsh Alakir Desert, or the mountain ranges of the Far East. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to me that the struggle mechanics would be present, so that the Red Guards can beat the hell out of each other, and then when anyone else shows up, the Red Guards will all stop pointing their sticks at each other, and immediately Superman punch anyone that gets in their way of their good sporting fight. Similar to how the Seasi have been given a unique scale for how human or serpentine in appearance they are, there will also be a scale for how clean or dirty, or how undead or human an appearance a character model is. Though I don't expect these two other scales will be used that often for much other than fully on or fully off. Especially the undead one, because while I can imagine situations where a scale for how dirty someone's character model might be is, in use? I certainly can't remember the last time I saw someone that was half undead. Stronghold culture is going to be a unique cultural tenet that gives Orcish realms unique succession mechanics, men at arms, and court positions for the three wives of the chieftain that are not the primary one. The stronghold is not a place where lineage matters so much as the strength of one's arm. In Orcish realms, temporary though they may be, upon succession, the sons of the Leif Chieftain will fight amongst one another for the right to be the next ruler. Briefly before I end this video, I thought I may as well touch on lifespan traits. A new congenital trait the mod will be adding for men and mer races to better represent the varying lifespans of these races. While all Myr, or Elves, will have a lifespan trait that ranges at least somewhere between 1 and 3, men typically do not. However, mixed race characters will be able to have a lifespan trait that is somewhere between their, what their parents have. So, if a Breton, who does not have any lifespan traits, marries a Elf, from the Adamantine Tower, for example. And that elf has a lifespan trait of two. Their children will have lifespans between one and two. Or maybe none at all, for all I understand. Lifespan one will typically leave a character 
dying around age 150. Lifespan 2 will be 50 years more than that, 200 years. Lifespan 3 will typically be up to 300 years. Therefore, an easy way to keep track of it would be 50% increase every time the trait tier goes up. Supposedly, at 7, it becomes immortality. Or so I hear. So, uh, although, unfortunately, Orgnum won't be in the mod, as the devs have a policy of not wanting any god characters, if he was added in any way, he would probably have the lifespan 7 trait. Mages are also capable of extending their lifespan beyond normal means. Both men, mer, and even beast races may do this. Though supposedly elves are the best at it. The infamous and somewhat memed on Deveth Fear will be included in the mod, despite the ban on god characters, his quote-unquote immortality that is going to result in him being in, in nearly every bookmark of the mod is not quite enough for him to be cut. Which makes sense to me, to be honest. And while some people will be disappointed that Orgnum will not be in the mod, while Deveth Fear is, I can understand, because Orgnum is depicted as some sort of godlike figure who isn't really supposed to die at all, while the Veith Fear's long life isn't stated to be immortality, rather he just continues to extend his lifespan through ever greater use of magic. Therefore, while if Orgnum was in the game and he died of some sort of random accident, a hunting accident or something, a court physician accidentally killing him, you know? Well, that would be a problem with Orgnum, as it is in the Lord of the Rings mod when Sauron dies from physician accidentally stabbing him with his knife to death. If Deveth Fear died of some freak accident, it wouldn't be quite so strange. Now, I know I said I wouldn't talk about it long, but I suppose I did let it drag. I apologize. However, as I try to put together a video like this, being as inexperienced as I am, and needing to comb through so much information on my own, it can be difficult to find everything I need before I script it. And I realized when I was nearly done editing the video already that I had not included anything about elven lifespan traits, and I thought I should... Tuck it in at the end here. Thank you all for watching, and I really appreciate those who have managed to make it to the end somehow. That must mean that you're as excited for this mod to launch as I am, eh? Primary content I produce is CK3 streams. However, I do play other games. I welcome any who like my vibe and would like to chat to check out my streams live. I'm always happy to have people in chat to discuss about almost anything with. In my Discord, I discuss and make polls for whichever games or mod characters I should cover next. Perhaps soon I'll make a poll whether or not the next mod that I'll do a deep dive on would be either the a Game of Thrones mod or after the end. Thank you all once again. I'm thankful and excited by each viewer. I can hardly wait for this mod to be released so that I can make even more content to share with you all.